building and her observations about the city. So I, I think in this way, she's a really important figure for us. And in, within the syllabus, she, I think, offers a different um, view of the world in its um, uh, way that she's presenting architecture, the way that she presents the city, uh, that these two things are, um, for her, uh, these kinds of immediate observations, right? Like she, she's responding really in real time. She's documenting. Um, not through drawing, but through writing. Um, and uh, that, that it is very much about also a creative practice, I think. So like how, how one is inspired through the observations of the everyday, um, I think is uh, something very admirable. And, um, you know, I think we've seen this in some of the other architects that we've looked at as well, but in, in different ways. Um, you know, perhaps we could return to Jane Drew and, and think about um, how she started the architect's yearbook, um, or perhaps maybe some of Lena Bobardi's work, um, early work when she was still in Italy. But this, you know, this this kind of practice of documenting things from from the everyday, from going into the city, observing things, um, uh, the idea around social spaces, and a kind of critique of of that. At the same time, she is also looking at architecture in a really specific way. And I think it goes hand in hand with how she's looking at the city. Um, and so how uh, in the case of some of the blogs that she's writing specifically on her website, which is, is really the focus, um, I think, of, of her work um, that we'll look at today, um, more so than, than anything else, um, is just the, the way that she puts together the actual blog and you know, I'm sure it's similar to other things that you're familiar with, and um, and that we see quite often. Um, you know, we all know that in making blogs, there are certain softwares uh, people use to set up their page, right? So in that way, um, some of these things are um, not necessarily out of the box. But I, I think what the you know the, the the kind of careful selection of images to correspond with text is something that is carefully thought through, um, in my view. And um, the, the way that she's you know, selecting certain projects and talking about them, um, and that there's a concern for uh, very particular issues in, in her work. Um, and so I think these are some things that, that we could um, definitely start to you know, uh, pull out um, and, and begin to look at. Um, let me see here. So one thing I wanted to talk about, so I want to start with this text. Um, so it's, it's a little old, but I think it, it shows already, um, you know, uh, her thinking and certainly what um, I would say is she's become, you know, known for and is, is important in her work. Um, so the title of this blog, which I think it's blog 22, uh, Mind Shifts, Limited Means Can Yield Greater Beauty. Um, so where we left off last week and looking at the um, Graciela Turba um, uh, photography studio in Mexico City that she had, was writing an article about for, for Domus, um, here she's talking about, now this is five years earlier, right? And so I, I think it's quite interesting now to see something from last week, so recent writing about brick, also this kind of um, perforated brick pattern. Um, it clearly, it's, it's something she's deeply interested in and, and on her mind and becomes part of um, this ongoing series of, of writings. Um, and so already we see this, but you know, this is a, a very different project than the one for the photographer in Mexico City. Um, in this case, the idea of this house, um, it's called Termitary House by Da Nang from Vietnam. Uh, and you know, here she's listing out the cost of construction. Mm -hmm. So what does this tell us already about um, her, her interests and her work, right? She's, she's a figure who is interested in the world at large. And so she's already establishing through her writing um, observations or, about architecture um, in, in places across the world, right? So she's not just focused on one region. Um, and even though I think a majority of her blog texts are about Africa um, and perhaps Western Africa, but here she's talking about a, a project in Vietnam. So already we get a kind of sense of her, um, let's see, her, her vision uh, for thinking 
as an architect and thinking as an architect in the world at large in this, in this particular moment um, and thinking through a certain set of materials. So in this case, a simple block and brick uh, building, right? Um, so something very small. So as she starts to write, and I really appreciate her writing for the, the just this very clear, the kind of direct and um, I think immediate um, accessibility, I think we have as readers to her writings. Um, so, she, you know, and she's, she's very declarative in her statements, right? As architects, we have been learning to do more with less since the last economic downturn. Um, I think that's true, but anyway, this proves very difficult as through the years, creativity in architecture has to often has too often been synonymous with the technically heroic, the strange, or the purely sculptural, and too often the expensive. So I think this is also quite important statement. So she's already, you know, she kind of gives us the image, right? This is the first thing we see is the image of the, of the house. Um, and then she starts off with these two statements, right? Already sort of saying, um, you know, what has, what has already been um, for a long time, um, a criticism of architecture, right? That it becomes so expensive, it's sculptural, um, it's, um, you know, overly wrought through the technology um, or the technical, um, but in a way, you know, she, she's, so she's already sort of setting the stage for um, what she's interested to talk about and interested in, in her work. Um, so anyhow, so she goes on to say these projects push the technical envelope and can be quite astonishing and awe-inspiring, which is great. But surely architecture is first and foremost about making space, right? So here she's you know, asking then a question, right? So I think as, as a, a kind of strategy for writing, um, you know, sort of setting up a few very declarative and clear statements um, and then drawing us in more by then asking a question. So in a way, just to kind of go through the writing um, how, how she's um, breaking this down for us. So I, I think this is important, especially I would say as for you guys in the studio, coming to the end of the semester, how do you begin to um, explain your projects and uh, present your projects, present your work, your ideas, right, through something that becomes very much more declarative than about this is what I did, Right. But here, here are the issues I'm concerned about. And then even, you know, throwing a question to kind of draw, um, draw people in, I think could be, um, you know, is a very useful um, kind of strategy or approach. Um, why is it that unless great monetary means are put to use, we believe that only the basic, uh, the bland, the boring can result? Does easy access to fancy tools and materials often compromise the ability to create? So she goes on, obviously, a few more questions, um, which is which is very interesting and um, is, you know, I would say kind of returns us to um, when we had Deanna Agrest come uh, for the seminar, you know, she was saying she always had these set of questions, right? This was always for her, or maybe she even had just one question, I think at one point she was describing, um, as the, the thing that motivated her in her research and her work at a really young age and you know um, probably in a kind of similar age to to Miriam right so and which is like also for the majority of you guys your ages right so I think what are these kind of key questions you can you know you can begin to ask um, you know and so then she, she goes on here and talks about this is short, it's just like two more pages. I wanna go through this. Um, the economic hard times that hit America and Europe are a basic fact of life in most African countries. So as African architects, if we want to create architecture that responds to our realities, we have to become really good at making spaces that use available materials in creative ways to fulfill the needs of the people that will be inhabiting them functionally uh, sorry, functionality, ventilation, thermal comfort, solar control, etc. But this is also a really exciting premise for making architecture. Our limited access to certain technologically advanced materials, which are really only necessary if we are trying to recreate a foreign way of building, um, is actually a marvelous opportunity. Right, so, okay, so here then also she's, she's going deeper into what she means exactly, right? So she's kind of setting the stage by talking about, uh, you know, the, the economic constraints that have happened in the US and Europe, um, which are really, as she's pointing out, this is business as usual in a majority of the world, right? And so, you know, kind of 
reminding the audience and the reader um, that while what may be exceptional in one place is actually quite the norm um, everywhere else, right? So we, we operate from a place of, of privilege in these other, um, in these other uh, places, right? And, um, and, and it's much harder uh, in, in, in the places like she's describing here in the case of Africa. Um, you know, and so she also, what I think in a, a very nice way, describes herself without calling herself out by name, right? So as African architects, right? So she's very um, pointed and, um, in, and, and assertive in saying who she is, right? Through the writing, right? But she's not saying I, but she's saying so as African architects. So I think that's really, that's interesting. Uh, you know, it's also, she's not describing herself as a woman architect either. She's an architect, right? So I think that's also, you know, quite, quite important to note that point. Um, anyway, okay, so, uh, and then further, you know, this paragraph talks about ideas around um, materials, but she's also doing it in a way that she's never forgetting about space, right? So it's both about technology, um, access to materials, what are those advances, um, and, you know, setting the distinction between, you know, working in a context that is not, um, uh, already built up of these advanced materials or technologies, right, that maybe is not even as urban, um, but just is operating through a whole other set of uh, constraints and a whole other set of resources, social structures, economic structures, right, so she really makes this, this hard line distinction, um, you know, and I think this is a really important question uh, for architecture, and I, and I would say also for for us at GSAP, because I think we are a school that looks at both of these sides, right? The, the, the highly technical, the highly um, advanced, um, so much materials, excess. Um, and then we're also dealing in studios and seminars and contexts and students who are from uh, other places around the world that bring a different um, viewpoint um, to the world, to building, to understanding what their um, places are, are made up of, right? And so um, to be able to have someone who can be of both minds uh, in a way and, and, and I think be, you know, respectful and thoughtful to think about when you start working in another location, you don't just immediately import all of these high tech technical materials and so on, right? And we go back to thinking about Lena Bobardi, who's bringing everything over from Europe, right? So, um, you know, on this kind of complex way of, of parsing through how do you build something? What do you build with? When's the right time to do that, right? So you guys should also feel free to jump in at any point here. Um, any case, okay, so, um, so, you know, what I think then she goes on to say is it allows us to focus on space, its quality, its light, its shadows, its tactility, its proportions, its uses, its poetry. So what here I think is also then really important is being able to return to all of these disciplinary concerns, right? So in a matter of a few sentences and this blog so far, she's, she's really laying out a very clear um, traje trajectory and thought process of how she approaches architecture, right? It's all of these things. It's not a matter of saying, I'm only going to look at one thing, form, and forget about the rest, right? Everything else is secondary. She's really saying, look, these are all the conditions under which we're, we're working today. Um, okay, so then she goes on to say, working on a project in a developing country can actually free architects from distracting technology and allows them to focus on what actually matters, the creation of beautiful spaces, not the production of a sculptural object. So um, anyway, I think this, is, this sentence is really um, key and I think this really summarizes um, for her what her interests are in, in architecture and the way she's thinking about building in the world. Um, so that's, that's quite important. You know, I think you, you could argue, well, we could hear more about how does that work. And that's where I think in this case, um, you, it's required that you go through uh, several of the blogs in that way and to really look at some of these other um, projects that she's worked on because she does get into that, into her, um, into some of her blogs. So I think what I'll do, I'll just finish this and then I'll jump to one of the blogs um, 
I wanted to just also briefly show um, the thesis project. I, hopefully you guys look through all of the essays and texts that I put on coursework. So you should look through them all. I'm not gonna cover them all today. Um, some of these things are for you just to also reference on your own and you know, download, you have them for your own collection of things. Um, and then at 9.45, um, Julia Gamalina from Madam Architect is going to join us. And we're going to talk about uh, Farshid as part of that um, session when she comes on. Um, I thought she had, had covered Miriam, but she says not yet. So um, I think when I met with her, she said maybe she was talking about that. So anyway, um, so we'll, we'll focus more on, on Farshid with, with her. Um, but I just wanted to have a little time to go through Mariam's work um, with you guys. So in many developing countries, beauty is in the everyday, in the utilitarian. Light is filtered and ventilation is achieved through a beautiful brick or carved screen. Roof parapets are full of symbolism. Building facades are expressive. Everyday clay water containers are worthy of an art exhibit. Mere entryways are exquisitely carved. In these places, beauty is everywhere, but is often missed as poverty is the only thing that catches materialistic eyes. But really, as we develop our, our architecture, we can inspire ourselves from the creativity that surrounds us everywhere. Made with limited means, injected beauty into everyday life, we can find endless variation and, and adaptations to the limited array of tools and materials that we have at our easy disposal to create stunning work. Our own brand of modernity can be born of such an approach rather than equating it to a bad and expensive copy of what modernity looks like elsewhere. So I think that's very poignant. And um, you know, I think if we kind of go back and look at someone like Jane Drew, right? She encountered these same kinds of questions to some degree, right? Or she came to these questions through her practice, right? As opposed to them being already inherent um, at the beginning of, of, of her, like starting her practice, right? So um, I think it's kind of interesting to think about in a way the starting of the class and then more towards the end of our class, how we're thinking about writing and um, immediacy. So let's go to this one. Let's see, Construction Magic. Can you guys all see this? I like the title, Construction Magic. <laughs> Mostly construction never feels like magic, but anyway. <laughs> um, okay, architecture is one of those fields that cannot fulfill its agenda by itself. That is very true. For architecture to become reality, not only do we architects often collaborate on designs, but we then need engineers, contractors, consultants, et cetera, to bring our work to life. This is sometimes painful, full of conflicts that can make the construction phase the least anticipated stage of a project, only made palatable by the fact that said project will soon become reality. So imagine my shock when I recently realized that collaborating with the builders, artisans, and contractors on our projects in, in Niger is becoming one of my favorite aspects of architecture practice. That, so that's quite remarkable, I think. So I, again, here, you know, I really appreciate her for um, the, the straightforward writing, the observation, and also, you know, what, what could really become very critical writing and, and somber and negative is not that at all. In fact, you know, here she's showing us the opposite, showing us a how to, how do you achieve that, right? And so, um, you know, through this kind of writing, through the documentation that she's showing, um, uh, you know, re revealing to us a way, a way of working and and what that, you know, what that looks like and what that process is like um, and to do that through writing, right? This is not um, so, let's say, lofty that we can't, um, you know, engage in, right? That Because there is always this idea, you know, as she says in the title, the kind of magic, right? That it's, it's um, uh, almost, um, you know, mystical or there's something around it that we, you know, we, we don't quite ever engage it. And um, it's, it's, um, you know, it's both something because it's so real and dirty in a way, right? Like you're in the dirt in concrete and, and, and brick and, and site work and these things, right? Architects have to engage in that. But often in academia, we never approach that, right? Or we do it only through, you know, a wall section or something like this, right? So here, you know, she's really um, showing us what that process is like and um, doing it in a way that is full of, um, you know, delight, actually. And so even in her 
previous article by sort of setting up issues around the everyday, she's, she's trying to find that even through the process of construction. So I think that's quite, um, quite important. Okay, um, I don't know that I wanna read through, through everything, but let me just go through this. In many African countries, we often complain about the lack of a skilled labor force in the construction field. For those of us who were trained in the global north, it is easy to get frustrated because things are not how we expect them to be. Consequently, a constant struggle has been figuring out how to find the right local people for our projects. When we conceived our first project using each bricks in Niger, the challenge was evidently finding the right contractor for the job. There had been a few projects in Niamey that sought to highlight the value of earth architecture. They were being financed by NGOs or private investors, so we looked them up to gauge the quality of the work we found projects we liked and asked around to find out who was the contractor for the job and whether the clients would recommend them. With those simple steps, we hired our NAMI 2000 contractor pictured above, and it has been a most rewarding collaboration. It turned out that through his exposure to earth techniques in previous projects, he was fast becoming an ardent proponent of projects that used it, leading us to be in perfect alignment of thought and ethos. Okay, so again, here, I think very revealing in terms of the process of how uh, you work, how you work in a place that maybe you're not accustomed to working, you don't have those necessary contacts um, or direct experience with building with someone, right? So she breaks this down very ca carefully and clearly. You know, in a way, this is also, it's, you know, what, what would you guys say this is as a style of writing? Um, on one hand, it's, it feels like, a kind of diary. Um, it's also somewhat of a report, maybe. Um, what do you guys think? I'm talking to just black screens here. <laughs> I, think, she, what do you think? I think I think you're I think you're right. I think it is kind of like a diary slash report, especially when I was reading through it. I don't know, like um, because but it's also pretty exclusive. Like it appeals to architects because I mean you you're laughing at certain things that she's saying because you know what it what it's like, right? So you can relate mm -hmm. to it. Yeah. Um, um, so in that sense, I don't know, it, it's it's super interesting. I really appreciate wait, hold on one sec. <laughs> Sorry, my mom's watching TV. Um, <laughs> I um I really I really appreciate that in this blog. I don't know, I get really interested when she talks about how people, she can, she connects with people. Like, so in the previous blog, she wrote about um, maybe local architecture and that, that she's interested in, um, you know, like really using the, the locality to build. And then in this one, she really talks about how she communicates um, with, with people and how she uh, communicates her design intention. And I don't know that like that interchange is so personal and she, I think this way of writing lends itself to talk about it really well. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think so too. Um, I think that's good. Anybody else? What do you guys think about this kind of style of writing? I mean, I, I really enjoyed like reading her work. It was so like, it's kind of breezy to sort of read through it, you know? And um, in some ways relatable because like when I was reading the Domus article that you shared, mm -hmm. I was actually thinking of, um, like the work in Pakistan a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and also about the ways how young architects are working, like even how I've worked there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and it was, it's just, I think she writes in a way that's, I mean, I, I really like it because <laughs> I didn't have to read over and over again, which I yeah. really appreciate as, even as an architect, you know? Yeah. So I kind of wonder that if she's like writing these things that are specific to architects, but also trying to approach like a wider audience, you know, to yes. not make it, too difficult yeah. to understand and it's almost like like the things she talks about are very like I mean they're like like even this article and the one in Doma is like they're just simple ideas of how we are building and how you know the building practices are changing especially in the global south or like how maybe they should be but I mean those are I think notions that are very much the interest of architects and not so much I don't think normally people care that much mm -hmm. um, per se but but yeah, I think I, I feel like if anyone read it, they would immediately understand um, yeah. what the gist of uh, the writing is. Yeah, I think it's interesting also because it's it's not just about architecture. 
um, ultimately, right? And I think this gets at what you're saying too, that it is, it, the writing is in a way, it's, it's opened up for a broader audience. And for sure, the allied disciplines um, can relate to this writing and find useful information in it and, and be drawn to it, I think, attracted to it. So I do think um, for sure, I would say, I mean, I have not met her personally, so I can't speak to that, but I would say, you know, that the idea of an architect as a public figure, um, for sure is interesting to her. And certainly doing the Rolex program and then teaming with Ajay, clearly you see that idea of how the architect through a kind of social work, um, being in the world in the way that Ajay had been, um, you know, and the work of research, the work of teaching um, somewhat, and, and then of course all the other projects that have much higher budgets and are, are maybe more cultural, um, institutional kind, more institutional work, let's say not cultural, but more institutional work um, in that way, um, clearly set up a, a kind of paradigm for her that she seems to be, be following. But, you know, I, I really appreciate the, the things she says, like she calls it Afrotecture, you know, these, these kinds of inventive words and, um, you know, again, like returning her as a figure into the, into the writing without calling herself out in it, right? And I think that's again, a very smart, clever, um, you know, thoughtful way to, to do that. And, as, you know, especially as a woman architect, right? Um, you know, uh, and in the context of, let's say, something like building and the construction site, um, you know, to sort of show us this experience, you know, but what's interesting is that she's doing it in a way where she's not, um, not every image is of her in the field <laughs> also, too. This is another tactic, right, that we've seen um, time and time again, where architects are, you know, showing themselves in the in the in the field um, you know she's doing it through writing anyway so i think it's interesting i'm not saying she's not ever putting herself there of course that happens but um you know i think that you know to, to sort of emphasize this idea of the um of the work of the buildings over the person right and that's sort of another like going back to the very first class like showing that selection of images right when we typed in uh, sejima versus nishisawa right what we saw um, was the image of the of the actual architect as opposed to the buildings right and so um you know so i really in that way i really like this format because she's showing um you know the content and it's less about herself as a as a figure right in the writing um you know, or again, to think about Lena Bobardi and herself standing on the staircase, right? So, you know, I think these are, um, you know, different, different attitudes, different approaches. And I don't know. Eduardo, were you going to say something? Oh, uh, um, just like, it's nice, like everyone said, it's nice to kind of have that like ease and almost like nonchalance to the writing, but it's still kind of full of, um, I don't know, like there, you, like you said, she like makes a point, like it's clear. Um, there's still that kind of weight to it that might that other sort of writing might have. Um, but I was also just thinking of kind of like the structure, um, or like the way the writing is sort of put together, and that it kind of complements the type of building and the way of working that she's sort of talking about. Um, yeah. That it like as a pair, they kind of work nice together. That yeah. it's not something overly wrought or like too out of the way with the words but that i don't know it just like reflects the building process and how she's talking about it right exactly yeah i think it's good i mean i also think it's quite um strong in setting up you know like bringing the subject of africa to also um you know to uh, an audience that would not um know it perhaps or think of it as the other and distant and as she even says in her writing right like this place of problems or there's you know less accessibility to things right but she you know she turns that she turns that around quite well um and 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 makes this um accessible to us right and i think that's also really important like how we from the global north how we think about the global south and other places around the world that are different than the context of you know New York City um, or other um, cities that have been constructed with you know the most um, accessible materials, uh, the most advanced technologies, etc. Right, um, and so I think that's also quite important um, a way of showing 
showing that, you know, but at the same time, she is still showing, you know, modern construction. It's not as though this is um, a return to some archaic way of building, right? Um, and, you know, there we could look back to Jane Drew and her book, Architecture um, and Environment, and those drawings, right, that she made of, of construction. This is very similar, right? So in a way, her blog is also kind of repeating that same, um, you know, sort of technical know-how, that same accessibility to materials, right? Just looking at this this image of um, uh, her uh, construction. I don't know if you can see my page here, but uh, you know, the construction site with the rebar, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, okay, um, let me try to see. I wonder. I wonder if we should be like critical in a sense that like who are who are her clients right i mean who is she building for who's funding who's actually funding the project i mean we know she's we know she's trying to be economic about it but i think that's more of a statement not just for africa but for everyone really right yeah exactly. um yeah right. yeah but i wonder about like what the criticism would be about the way she's building and writing about these things because she is she she is approaching it from a kind of foreign angle as well, even though she is African, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I'd just be interested in like a, a push against that or something. Yeah, sure. Um, how do you? What would you? What would you say about that if you were to write something? What would that be? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not. I'm not the. I'm not the the other side at all. Yes, but, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I, if anything, I'm more in line with her than. than mm -hmm. I mean, I think we all are, right? Because um, yeah, we yeah. can see it so clearly. Maybe that's also why it's easy for us to digest, mm -hmm. uh, because we are educated and we have like we can see these things from a different point of view as a, like a, almost like a plan, laying out a plan and kind of, you know, putting together the pieces. But I wonder about someone who's even more local right mm -hmm. and what connections that they've made that might differ from the way she's working maybe some of the challenges that they have that she doesn't mm -hmm. um right yeah and, and maybe even some of like the easier things that they go through that she has difficulties with so mm -hmm. i don't know just like a different yeah. yeah that's good i think that's good okay um let me see here wanted to just show let me see here screen share um, just briefly, the thesis project, in case you guys didn't have a chance to look at this. Um, sorry, I don't quite know what to do with this here. Okay. There we go. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so she's worked on um, at the University of Washington, as it says, mobile loitering. Uh, so the title, A Response to Public Space Needs in Niger's Post-Colonial, Highly Gendered Urban Context. Um, so, you know, again, here, I think, you know, someone who is, is very consistent in what she's writing, what she's thinking about, right, and, and kind of growing up in a way along these lines, setting all of this up for other articles to come. And so, um, you know, clearly thinking about writing as an important part of the practice. Um, and, you know, so here just, I, I would um, recommend that you guys go through this, but I thought, you know, it was interesting, you know, the first sentence, by their very nature, city streets provide opportunities to create life in between the more strongly defined entities of home, school, office, and markets. Um, in this space, one can easily appear to be on his or her way to somewhere but never actually to be going anywhere. The act of mobile loitering is a tactic that is commonly employed by young girls in Niger's capital of Niamey in order to socialize with one another. Anyhow, so, you know, it kind of goes on in this case, talking um, more specifically about the kind of quality of life of young girls specifically, but more broadly talking about the relationship of public space to these other kinds of programs. So, um, and her thesis, she says, the thesis, this thesis proposes a new type of public space that is adapted to the cultural norms of some Muslim cities. It takes the form of an activity circuit that links major public spaces currently used by the youth of the city while adding program components along a defined route to augment them. Um, so, you know, kind of setting up her, um, her ideas around, um, you know, 
both a sort of research project, but then also a speculative, in a way, design project. Um, so, um, and, and talking about ideas of uh, social space, social public space, uh, and the qualities of those spaces, right? So here, it's less about, a kind of, let's say, building component or a critique of technology, um, but really a kind of highly um, uh, focused look at what uh, cities and, and public space um, mean in that way. Um, and then this quote, which I thought was, was, was really interesting as well. It is a practice of being attuned to faint signals, flashes of important creativity and otherwise desperate maneuvers, small eruptions in the social fabric that provide new texture, small but important platforms from which to access new views. So somehow, while this is about, um, you know, a kind of description of um, ideas of public space, um, to me, it's, it also talks a little bit about the way she thinks just about the world at large and views into architecture, right? So these sort of, you know, her writings, you could think about them as these platforms um, that are being used uh, as, you know, to access new views into the world at large. So anyhow, um, but I would just invite you guys to look through this if you haven't. Um, I think also as a kind of counterpoint to, you um, you know, doing uh, just a, a drawing project as opposed to a, a kind of written thesis and a drawing project, right? But to, um, you know, just look at the way that this is broken down um, and, and how she starts, starts to talk about this and, and what are, um, you know, the kinds of choices that she's, she's making and, and where do we see those threads that go on um, and are, are then looked at in her, um, in her writings. Hi, I see Julia's here. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Good. <laughs> Relatively good. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I want to welcome you to our class and thank you for joining today. It's great to have you here. Um, super excited for the students. Um, so I'll just turn it over to you. Um, what, how would you like to start? I think it would be nice if you could, um, you know, tell the students about yourself and maybe we can have a little bit of a conversation and, mm -hmm. um, and then would you like me to pull up your website? Does that sound good? Or, how, or do you want to do that? Because do you, oh, you can oh. share everything from your screen, I think, for us that should work. Sure. Yeah. So we can do a couple of things. I can I can just casually tell you guys about myself and and take you through the website and we can look at some stuff. Or I can go through the PDF that um, Hillary had originally put together. Yeah. I don't know if that would be. It's very formal and it's like there's a lot of slides that I flip through, yeah. so I don't know if it's the best thing. But okay. we have those two options. Whatever you guys think. Okay. I'm I'm open. Whatever you feel comfortable talking about um, is good. So yeah. Um, Let's see, maybe I can use the PDF as a reference and maybe once we, um, once I talk about Madam Architect, instead of flipping through the slides, just because there are so many and in person I would flip through them quickly, but since it's digital and everything's a little slower, it might not be the best. So why don't I do the um, part of the presentation that's about me first and then I can um, share the Madam Architect website. So I'm just gonna- um, Okay, that sounds great. Let's see, I'm gonna share my screen. I think I would need um, permission to do so. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, let me know if you guys can see this. Yep. Great. Great. Oops, screen mode. Okay. Um, okay. So essentially what I was going to talk to you guys about today from the rolling hills of Pennsylvania where I've been <laughs> staying with my mom for the past month um, is sort of how Madam Architect came about and within that like it's just natural that I talk a little bit about my career path um, and then I delve into Madam Architect and what it's about and who we've profiled and I can do that again through um, through taking you guys through the website which will be a little bit more comprehensive I think but just to start for those that aren't familiar with it Madam Architect is a website that's dedicated to telling the stories of women that are working in the field it started out as being primarily um, women that are architects, um, that are professional architects, but then quickly I realized how many women there are in the industry that are, you know, really influencing things and advancing the industry through other ways, whether it be, you know, through law or being a CEO or being a journalist. And so, and, and those stories are typically not told um, because we do tend to focus so much on the design aspect. And so I've been um, profiling some of those women as well. Um, but to take it 
all the way back. Um, I was born in Siberia, uh, very, very, very far away. Um, and I lived there until I was eight years old. And then my family and I immigrated to Toronto, Canada. And so my sort of my formative preteen childhood years were primarily there. And then finally, um, I did high school in Colorado. And that's also when my little brother was born. Um, big, big age gap. But so I think just um, moving around so much totally started the seeds for, for um, where I am today in so many ways. Part of that was just, I simply became really attuned to the environment around me. And it's actually funny, moving from Novosibirsk to Toronto wasn't the biggest culture shock uh, because they were both really cosmopolitan cities and sort of the way I would navigate myself through the space around me and the city around me was kind of the same like public transportation and a lot of walking things like this so it actually didn't feel that foreign obviously the language and um, culture was a whole separate thing but then moving to Colorado that was a huge culture shock for us my mom didn't know how to drive I didn't know how to drive um, there were no there were hardly any like pedestrian sidewalks everything was very car oriented everything was very spread out it's the first time we had lived in a house um anyway so just like picking up on things like this the built environment is kind of what um, consolidated everything for me um so that's part of you know why i went into architecture and then the other part of it was just moving around so much um my mom very early on sat me down and basically said you know i can only guide you in certain ways. I'm also new here. So for things like applying to college and taking the SATs and anything to do with um, navigating academics in my career, she was like, I, I can't really help you with that. Like I can give you general like people advice and life advice, but um, for specifics on how to do things in the States, you're going to have to go to your teachers. And so I had always done that. And then all through college, I would go to my professors. Um, so that that mentorship aspect and just asking lots of questions on on topics beyond just like the assignment in front of me was um, became a part of my life very early on. Um, so like I mentioned, I studied architecture at Cornell. And one thing that has been a constant throughout all of my schooling, um, you know, all the way from elementary school, through through university was that it was always very dense just like extracurriculars galore and sports um, all kinds of like theater I did a lot of theater in high school and so it was never just about um, one aspect for example not just about design or not only about writing but like everything coming together um, and so finally eventually when I entered into professional practice um, and started working as a designer, as an architect. Um, I'm not licensed, so you know I can't say that. But um, I, that's something that I realized that working nine to five, or more like nine to nine, and only being focused on drafting. On the one hand, it's uh, you know a really great foundation because you really do get into all the nitty gritty, and you're forced to work things out in that way. For me, it wasn't right just because I was so used to such variety and stimulation in all kinds of different ways, and I think I was always really craving that. And actually, that's how that's how I started thinking about um, integrating more writing into my career. That's something I always knew I wanted to do, and. You know, I had grown up journaling a lot and um, as much as I drew growing up, and that's another part of the reason why I got into this, I also wrote a lot and I would like, you know, write like little books growing up and illustrate them. So it was always the image and the word. And working in architecture, I realized it was mostly about the image and beyond that, mostly about kind of the technical aspects, which just didn't, it wasn't me. Um, I didn't feel like myself doing only that. So then after I had um, worked at a firm called Studio V, this is where this image is from, um, only working on design and, and sort of some construction aspects, I went over to another company that focused on workplace, um, workplace design for companies like Squarespace and Tumblr and these really like contemporary and fun tech platforms. And I had wanted to try that scale of work just because, you know, I'm sure you guys know this about architecture, but projects take a long time, design takes a long time, buildings take a long time to come to fruition. And I thought by doing something more interior based, um, it would just be a little bit of a quicker timeline and I'd be able to see a project from start to finish. And boy, did I not realize how true that would be and what that would mean. Because when I first joined, I started working on company headquarters for a new company, a new media company that was going to be um, a combination of Horizon Media and um, an Asian counterpart. Um, and they were starting from scratch. They had just hired all of their C-suite level employees, you know, a new CEO, a new CFO, things like this. And 
I came to the company at a point where they were just about to start doing interviews with all of these people. And so I was in the room when um, we were interviewing them about what do you envision the company to be? What do you envision the space to be? So this like love of interviewing, um, it had started before, but it was um, certainly reinforced there. And so, you know, I was involved at this very, very, very early stage, then worked on the design of, um, of this project in Los Angeles through construction documents, did some CA stuff. And then um, I, I had a project go on hold, another project for about two weeks, and I wanted to do something with that time. And the other thing that was happening at this company is that they brought on um, kind of an interim director of communications for um, a temporary period of time. And she was this really, really fascinating German art historian and just like wore super amazing clothes and <laughs> just like interacted people in um, ways that I hoped to um, as well one day. And so in this kind of two week period of pencils down, I just came up to her, I got permission from my project managers and I came up to her and said, like, what do you need? I wanna help you with, with any communications because I knew that she was overworked. She was only the only person um, that was doing that at the time. And so she said, oh my gosh, thank God. Like, yes, I can put you to work. And so I ended up actually promoting the project that I had just worked on, um, you know, posting about it on social media, pitching it to press, uh, researching press outlets to pitch it to, and kind of saw the communication side of the practice, also submitting it for awards, um, which is a really great exercise. I mean, you guys think about how to present your projects in studio. I mean, it's very similar to that. You just figure out how to talk about your work in a very succinct way and for a very specific audience, whether it's press or an award submission or whatever it is, or the general public with social media. And so after I had worked with her on this, I realized that I really wanted to focus on this for a little bit. I think uh, to be completely frank, I was also just burned out from the hours involved in working on design and maybe wanted to take a break in that way. Um, and so I asked this company if this is something I could do full time and they said, no, um, you know, with firms, especially smaller firms, it's, um, there's budgets and there's so much that, um, that they might not be able to take on that's overhead, which is, you know, um, I don't know how much you guys know about <laughs> the business side of the practice, but essentially it's just things that you're paying for that um, your clients aren't paying for and not all firms can afford that. So anyway, because of this, I then um, decided that I should look at other firms Then I went on to Cooper Robertson um, as kind of a stepping stone in between firms and helped them with marketing and business development and communications efforts. So kind of the trifecta of, of um, firm development. And from there realized that the business development side of things is what I had um, would wanna try next. It's just, I wanted to get to know the industry at all levels, not just consultant facing, not just client facing, but like uh, just all the players that are involved I thought would be good for me to know about early on. So I went to FX Collaborative and there I worked in their cultural educational studio, um, trying to find work with museums and universities and libraries. And that work, I mean, I was doing it specifically for that studio only because that work is fewer and farther between. I mean, if you think about a developer, their their aim is to put out projects, you know, every couple of years um, and very often, and you know, they the phone rings a lot uh, at architecture firms if you have some of those developer connections. Whereas with institutional projects, you know, the Statue of Liberty Museum is probably gonna be the only project that they build for, you know, um, maybe a quarter century even. So you really do have to be more proactive about those business development efforts and that's what I did. Um, now I'm at a firm called Trahan Architects full time, which I'll get to in a second, but that just gives you sort of the career arc and how I was able to integrate more writing into my career and get to know some of the people around um, beyond maybe the consultants that you'd work with on a project. And that has been really, really, um, really satisfying. Anyway, taking you guys back to this moment at Studio V when, um, when I was working in design. So wh uh, what I had just described, that's all about professional practice and sort of my nine to five schedule. Obviously there was a whole other thread happening simultaneously, which is what had led to Madam Architect. And so again, when I had graduated from school and was working in the industry, I realized that that mentorship that I was getting from my teachers and professors that I had talked about, um, I, there, that was no longer like a given or a built-in system in professional practice, just because um, of course you can talk to people that you 
work with about certain things. And especially if you're at a larger firm where you can find a mentor that's maybe not necessarily working with you on projects. So there's no kind of conflict of interest there. Um, but I was working for smaller firms and I didn't feel comfortable talking to people about sort of my general career goals or the fact that I was only planning on staying at the firm for another year. You know, there's just some things you, you don't want to talk about um, with your with your bosses or the people that you work with. And also um, all the teachers that I had described that I would talk to were all women women because I just like as a young kid I felt more comfortable seeking out kind of mother figures um, and talking to you know a, a sort of a, a man was not was not what I was doing when I was like eight years old anyway and so there were frankly just not that many women around me either in professional practice that I wanted to talk to so I realized I needed to be a little bit more proactive um, about seeking out mentors sort of in the same way that you do business development and you don't want to be reactive to things you really want to get ahead of things and be proactive about it that's how I went about finding some mentors and some women to talk to and look up to thankfully one of my professors and I got I really encourage you guys to um, take as much advantage of your professors as possible not not in the you know not in not in the sense of um, of taking advantage, but just like they are the gateway to so many things for you that, um, you know, make a list of all your favorite professors and just like make appointments with them to talk about everything else that's outside of your schoolwork because it just, it plants the seed for so many amazing things, I think. Hillary, I hope you don't get overwhelmed with, <laughs> with emails after this. <laughs> um, but anyway, one of my professors started a nonprofit called Architects. Um, that was mainly meant, it was meant to be, you know, a forum for women to be able to talk and share information, but also it was meant to bridge the gap between practice and academia because she thought that that was something um, that needed to be done. The wonderful thing about architects is they hosted these um, BRICS mentorship sessions, which were amazing. It was, um, they were very intimate meetings at someone's home. Um, and it was kind of an open door thing for young women to come in and ask questions. And sometimes they would be um, like kind of just open sessions and we could talk about anything. And other times they would be themed. And so we talked about, you know, those that want to start a family on, you know, just lessons learned from other mothers in the industry. We talked about getting your license, um, kind of um, negotiating salary, all kinds of things. And at this point is when I was really craving that writing aspect that was so present in my life that wasn't when I was working as a designer. And so I, I knew that architects had an online blog, um, just like from time to time, someone would write something and post it. And so I said, can I report back from these amazing sessions where I'm getting so much great advice? And can I post about it on the blog? They said yes. And so I did that a little bit. And finally, out of these sessions, I had also met some really great mentors. And, and started meeting with them regularly and was also getting such good advice that I really, really wanted to share it. I just, after every session I would walk out um, or after every mentorship meeting, I would walk out and be so excited to start the next day and be so motivated to move my career along. And um, I just thought that like everyone should be feeling that way. Um, so I started interviewing, I think at first it was very, very sporadic. I think I did like four interviews over the course of two years. So one every six months, just because that was the time that I had. Um, and also because I was much slower at editing and things like this at the time. Now, you know, I'll, now that I've done so many, it's a lot faster, um, but it certainly wasn't at the time. And so what happened is those four initial interviews, I had talked to Vivian Lee, um, who was formerly at Richard Meyer. Now she's at Woods Baggett. Um, it was time for her to do that. And, um, with her, what I had noticed, she was my first interview, and I realized I was speaking to somebody sort of at the peak of their career that was looking back at a lot of things. And I realized, wow, I have so many um, girlfriends that I know that are kind of in the trenches right now going through, you know, starting a firm or having a baby. What is that like? And so then I spoke to a woman, Irina Schneid, who's a teacher at Pratt, a professor at Pratt, and she she was just starting her teaching career. She was just um, kind of recalibrating from working in an office to being a full time faculty. And also she had just had her first daughter, her first child. And so we talked about that. Next, I interviewed Sarah LaPergolo, a partner at Seldorf, also kind of looking back at a lot of things and, um, you know, having achieved what she has achieved in her career. And then talked to another younger woman, Jenny Pazin, who was starting a firm and also pregnant while she was starting a firm. Um, so having that collection of a variety of um, kind of experience levels was really helpful. 
Um, but then I realized, you know, it could really be so much more. And so Architects and I decided to do a guest editorship where I would interview a woman a week for about three months. It ended up being, I think, four months because I had reached out to um, a little bit more women than, I, than was necessary just because I figured some people would say no, but nobody said no. <laughs> so then it was a four month thing. Um, and that's how that's how Madam Architect kind of officially got started. It was a column, a guest editorship on Architects' blog, and I called it Madam Architect. I think it was called Conversations on Finding Your Place and Hitting Your Stride or something. And this is Hay Slade, um, owner of Slade Architecture. And anyway, after I had done this guest editorship, the I had never expected this, but the interviews got so much great feedback and were shared everywhere. And I just, I was really not expecting that kind of response and I didn't realize how needed something like this was. Um, and so when the guest editorship was wrapping up, I figured, I mean, I don't want to stop this because I just really enjoy every part of the process so much from, you know, the conversation to the editing, uploading the images, sharing it with the world, hearing the feedback um, that I decided to launch Madam Architect as its own entity. And so it went live as a website in May of 2018. So we're actually coming up on our on our second year anniversary, we were going to have a party. I was, I was deep into planning with the Jane Hotel, and then of course everything happened. So the party is postponed, but hopefully we can all get together and celebrate soon. Um, so that's, I mean, I can stop here. That's kind of the the general career arc. I'll just run through maybe what I do at Trahan now because, um, again, my my daytime title is director of strategy at Trahan Architects. They're a firm that's based between New Orleans and New York. And people often ask me what strategy means, and I'll say that it means a different thing for different firms. For example, when I was at A plus I, there was a director of strategy there, and for him it was mo more about design strategy. So his role was really about being there, um, being very hands-on on the very early stages of a project and figuring out what, you know, what the best design is or like what the best initial concept is from a strategy perspective. Um, a tray hand strategy means something else. It's basically um, just business development strategy, but in all, um, not not just about getting new business, although in some ways, like everything is about getting new business and keeping the firm going, but also about our, the brand and how we talk about ourselves, certainly about communications and media. And so really strategy for me now means putting my design, communications, marketing, and business development background all together and figuring out how we can evolve tray hand architects. And also, of course, some of the lessons learned with Madam Architect, because Trey, my boss, really sees Madam Architect as a startup that I've been able to sort of launch and, and develop and um, uh, kind of evolve. And so he wanted me to bring some of that thinking into, into the world of practice. Um, so yes, that was a lot. That was <laughs> a mouthful. So um, let me know if you guys need any sort of break. But um, otherwise, I have the Madam Architect website pulled up. Yeah, um, right. Do you guys want to, should we take any questions now or take a pause or should I just keep going? It's up to you. It's, if, if anybody has any questions, they're welcome to ask. Yeah, you can always raise their hand. Or just call out. That's good, what we've been doing. Um, yeah, otherwise I think we can keep going. Um, sure. One thing we were talking a little bit about, which I did think I mentioned to you, is about Farshid and um, yeah. I think it's a, to especially kind of Maybe we could talk a little more in depth about her interview and something mm -hmm. like that. Because I've shared um, some text for these guys to have looked at for today. Um, oh, great. They'll be looking at it after. Um, and yeah. Great. Yeah, for sure. She is one of she was one of my favorite interviews. And I was lucky to meet with her for breakfast in London. I had gone to London on a personal trip to visit a girlfriend of mine and um, got an email from uh, from a TA of mine at Cornell, it's like so many connections all over the place that was like, I see you're in London, do you want to talk to Farshid? And I was like, oh my gosh, how can I say no? I mean, I didn't want it to be a work trip because I <laughs> had really needed a break at the time, but we ended up meeting actually over breakfast, like a true English breakfast, and she ordered porridge, and I just like <laughs> thought that was the, the best thing. Um, but I'll give you guys a little bit of a background on Madam Architect and take you through the website and then we can look at her interview, but basically, it has, Madam Architect has really evolved and we're continuing to evolve. We're actually going to launch a new column next week. And, and this also, so we were planning to launch this new column for a long time. It's going to be about writing about your work. And then 
actually one of the essays is going to lead into another column that we're going to start kind of in response to the COVID crisis. Um, I'll talk about that in a second, but there's a lot of new things happening and um, thankfully I'm getting some other writers on board because at this point I just can't handle <laughs> everything myself, It's um, especially with work. Um, so the interviews really did start as kind of interviewing um, women in architecture on their careers and at first the, the, uh, this has always been actually a priorities variety in every sense of the word. I mean, racial diversity, of course, also diversity in age, you know, we don't, we're not just profiling emerging architects, although we do talk to a lot of them, but we also talk to people that are quite seasoned, you know, maybe in corporate offices or, um, you know, that have just been in the, in the industry for a long time. Um, also diversity of focus, like maybe you do some materials research that's, you know, very unique or um, you approach architecture from a lens of, I don't know, um, whatever, whatever the filter might be, but we try to get variety of that in some ways. And then obviously we talk to, you know, historians and curators, um, communications professionals. The interview that went up yesterday is actually with a PR firm um, and, you know, people like that tend to be so behind the scenes or tend to be such kind of catalysts for other people to get good recognition and tell their stories, but they don't always get to tell their stories themselves. So things like that are really important. Um, let's see, so uh, just some of the categories. So we have, um, this is what's great about the new website. I don't know how many of you guys have seen the old website, but it wasn't able to categorize the interviews in this way. So I'm really happy that now we can, but our most popular interviews in 2020 have been with um, MVRDVs, Natalie DeVries, Jennifer Bonner, Kim Neuscheller, who's a trained architect who's now in construction and um, has just seen the industry from so many sides. I would encourage you guys to read that one. And then Kim Holden, who used to be the founding partner at Shop Architects and who's now a doula, a birth and postpartum doula. So that was pretty cool and it got picked, by, picked up by Fast Company, um, a really cool story. But let's see, so for example, just to give you guys um, an idea of how I've been kind of categorizing this, like we have a lot of people that talk about activism in the profession, you know, Gabrielle Bullock, who's um, the third interview in this column, Architecture and Activism, she, she's the Director of Global Diversity um, at Perkins and Will, and so, you know, we talked about what that means and about how she's defining success in her role, and that's a really interesting thing. It's like, how do you define success in, in um, kind of expanding diversity in your firm, in the field, etc., and um, that was really great. Kimberly Dowdell also, oh my gosh, what she's lived like nine lives in the industry and she went to school for public policy after studying architecture and urban planning, um, has worked in development for the government, at firms, everything. Um, so that's been really important. And then Madam Julia, Architect Julia, uh -huh. really sorry to interrupt. I just want to make yeah. sure, are we on the right screen for you, what you want to show? It's no. just as today on Madam Architect, what we oh, do. I'm so sorry for yeah, thank that. you. Sorry. Yep. Um, I'm just going to stop the share for a second. I've here I have been taking you guys to the website and not realizing that it's not um, showing the right thing. Okay, here we are. Let's see. Okay, are you guys seeing the categories now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, super. So what I was talking about um, just now architecture and activism, that was this side of things. Um, then we also, you know, Madam Architect Abroad, we try to talk to people that are not only based in New York, which was kind of how the whole project started. And that was because I was able to meet with people face to face, which I found really important to sort of get some of that intimacy um, and to make sure that that carried on into the, the, the uh, finished work. But we have spoken to, you know, Anna Paula Ruiz Galindo. She's Mexico City based, obviously Farshid is in London, Regine Leibinger is in Berlin, um, Frida Escobedo is also in Mexico City and Dorothy Mandrup is in um, um, Copenhagen. And so um, there's geographic variety too. In the States, you know, we've talked to people based in Boston, Los Angeles, Seattle, Cleveland, New Orleans um, and Atlanta, and we're starting to do more of that. Then, you know, we've talked to people that are really driving the business side of architecture. So Kirsten Sibilia is like a marketing guru for Datner and has been doing that um, for the majority of her career. Bola williams Oli is in finance. Um, she's a CFO. So that's a fun take, a fun take on the profession too. Um, then, you know, we talked to SOM's counsel, Sarah Sparer, and that's a really fascinating thing that we certainly don't talk about in school, just like intellectual property and scope creep and all kinds of things. And then finally, you know, Sheila Sogard, who's big CEO, and Tammy Hausman, who's a communications professional. 
And then entrepreneurship has been a big theme for us. I, I also noticed that we tend to talk to a lot of founders, which um, is, re is really, really good. And, you know, there's a ton of firms that are doing really extraordinary work and kind of advancing the, the, the industry and the firms that they create on the projects they do. But we also then talk to people at kind of these much larger offices, um, because that's also a, a really interesting thing. And there's a lot of things to be learned about just like navigating things politically. Um, but on in terms of entre entrepreneurship, we have, you know, this, these two women that founded a PR company, there is an amazing blog out there called Afro Chic. And actually, it started as a blog, it's now a brand and they do their own design. But we talked to Janine Hayes specifically about the COVID crisis and all of us being at home now and like how you can make your home more dynamic. On Top New York, also a publication that's now a company, um, obviously Kim Holden's new, um, new startup. And we talked to Andrea Steele about kind of being a partner with Enrique Norton for so long and then now going off on her own. Um, let's see, we also, so in addition to the kind of the feature interviews, we also do a days with column where we just take, you know, ask um, a person to write up what their day looks like because I think it's super interesting to see how people integrate all the things that are important to them in the kind of the, the span of their careers, but then also at the scale of one day and just like how they manage their time and um, how, they, how they incorporate what and when. Um, so we've done a couple of these. Um, we, we do these once a month. And, and then also we used to do a column called Favorite Things where I just wanted a counterpoint to some of these he heavier, longer interviews and just something fresh and light and for women to just give their recommendations about their favorite movies and books and things like this. Um, this actually, I'll tell you guys, that this was getting the least readership, I think partly because we weren't promoting it as much. We weren't pushing it out on all the social media platforms, but also, um, you know, the images that I was using for this, I just pulled from Google, which, um, I could get into trouble with because <laughs> I do not own these images and the women that I interviewed don't own these images. So we're thinking about if we're going to continue this or not. And if we do, it might just have to be images that women take themselves of like the book in their home or whatever, but more on that. And then finally, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this section, but we have an Ask the Editors column where once a month we'll, we'll compile some of the questions that we get um, often and we'll kind of write answers to them. So, you know, we're getting a lot of questions now about what happens when people are going to be graduating in May. And so we had Elaine Molinar, who's managing partner at Snohetta, and Hayes Slade, who owns a firm, kind of talk about what that might mean, what are the best things you can do. Um, we talked about, you know, working from home, um, about just like getting started in the industry and the resources you should use. So I would encourage you guys to flip through this. And if you have any other questions, please send them to, um, to the submission form on the website. So anyway, um, that's kind of what it is today. And again, we're going to launch a couple of things next week. So also sign up for our newsletter. You'll hear about those. Um, and then Farshid, oh my gosh, that was, yeah. I, one of my favorite, favorite interviews to have conducted. Um, but basically we just talked about how she got started from the beginning. And one thing I learned and I keep learning from these interviews is that there are so many, I don't know if you guys have talked about this yet, but Europe had such a great competition system for young architects through a lot of the nineties and maybe the early two thousands. I'm not sure if they do so much anymore. And I don't know if it's something that the United States ever faced, but so many women that I talked to that um, have started companies in Europe have been able to do so because they've won, like they would apply for competitions, win these prizes, get a really great financial award and, um, and use that to launch their own firms. And so this is what Farshid did with her then husband um, and, and business partner who now has his own firm as well. Um, but we sort of talked about that and getting started um, we, you know, uh, I think she also talked a lot about her professors being um, really helpful and also other architects. She talked specifically about working in Japan um, on the Yokohama International Cruise Terminal. And she said that when they were working on this, uh, the, the Japanese architects would actually be really, really helpful. There wasn't any sort of competitive um, nature. Or, I mean, maybe, maybe not that she talked about, but um, she said there was really a system of nurturing in Japan that was and sort of mentorship professionally in this way that also didn't quite exist in the States or wherever else she was working in, in Europe. Um, but then we really talked about what it means to, um, you know, she, she was in practice with her partner, they had split up, they split up the practice and so she kind of was reborn and started her own firm. 
um, after that and has done some very, very significant work. Like this is, you know, the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Cleveland. Um, but she talked a lot in her interview about having to continue to reinvent herself in order to stay relevant. I think, you know, so often you hear in the industry, like, where's the fresh young talent? You know, who's going to bring new ideas to the table? And of course, people just entering the industry will, will do that. And you guys will all do that. Um, but it doesn't mean that those that have been in the industry for a long time can't also continue to contribute in innovative ways. And that's something I think that's been really important to her and that she's very conscious of, you know, I can't just continue with business as usual. I can't just continue to do work in the same way that I've approached it in the past because it's a different world now. So what does that mean? And, um, and how can I continue to advance my practice given all that? Um, so that's the summary. Um, it's funny when I asked her, we talked a little bit about business development and it's really funny to ask that of some architects because some people are very open about how they get new work. They'll just say, oh, you know, it was serendipitous in this way. I mean, sometimes it's serendipitous, sometimes it's not. Um, other people will, will be a little bit more general about how they get work. And then Farshid was just like, I do my best. Like, I think some people are kind of reluctant to to give out their, their um, new business pursuit secrets, which is like totally fair. Um, but let's see, what did we talk about? We did talk, one thing I didn't mention is I try not to, in these interviews, ask about, you know, what is it like being a woman in architecture? Because number one, we all know, like, I think there's enough that's been written about that. Obviously it's, um, you know, if you're a woman in the field, there have been so many disadvantages throughout the years. Um, but sometimes of course, it inevitably comes up. Um, and so one thing we talked about is there was a headline of an article that was written that was something like Farshid Musavi beats out David Chipperfield and OMA for this project. And it was almost like, I don't know, the way I read it was, it was almost like the headline was suggesting, oh my gosh, we can't believe that a woman beat out these two men. I mean, I think in some ways it was congratulatory, but in other ways it was like, this shouldn't even be, um, that that shouldn't be the sentiment of the headline like it should be like this architect got this project and yes obviously other architects didn't but it shouldn't be in this way that like uh we can't believe this woman beat these men so we talked a little bit about that which is an interesting thing and maybe i had misinterpreted the headline and the sentiment behind it but um that's just like the first impression i got that we talked about um what else That's good. What about um, just her write? Did you talk with her about her writing in general? She's done books with students and, um, mm -hmm. you know, this, and given so many lectures. I think part of the course is about uh, looking at a broad range of forms of writing. Um, so mm -hmm. I was curious to know if you spoke with her about, about any of those things. Yeah, not so much in the interview, more just off like in and around the conversation we were having, but essentially that was that just fed into how she has able to maintain momentum and kind of stay relevant and reinvent herself. And I think, you know, women um, also write less about their work than men do. And this is something Hillary and I talked about when we had met. Um, and writing is a really crucial component to advancing your practice and advancing ideas. And it's, you know, people can look at your building and think whatever they think of it. It's, I mean, it's kind of like looking at a piece of art, you know, everyone's going to have a different, a different reaction to it, a different interpretation that's based on their own life experiences. Um, but in, but so in through some of the writing and some of the lectures that she's given, I mean, a, that's how you stay in front of people and that's how you continue. It's just like a business development thing. It's how you keep reminding people that you're here and you're here to contribute something. Um, but also it's, I think it's a way for people to connect with your work on another level which has been really helpful. We, yeah, we didn't, we didn't talk too, too much about it. Um, but I would say just like having the experience that I have in the industry is just another way to continue to contribute. And, and as many ways as you can do that, you know, through obviously through project work, but also through exhibitions, through your writing, through speaking, through, I don't know, documentaries, filmmaking, whatever it is, those are all different outlets to continue to communicate and to sort of spread spread your ideas, um, spread your influence, and it's a good, definitely something that should be paid attention to and that architects should be doing more of. My voice is getting raspy. <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear that, but <laughs> it's been a lot of, I have, this is actually my third um, student presentation this week. I think the oh, wow. first yeah. few weeks of um, 
stay home were very, it was just like a lot of work and finishing deadlines and things like this, but somehow the speaking stuff really started this week and I'm losing my voice now. <laughs> yes. It, it, if you're not used to it, it gets, it, it definitely can happen for sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. I don't do you, do any of the students have any questions at this time? Yes, yes. Please ask your questions. Yeah. I'm sure there must be some. Yeah, Julia, this is a, uh really awesome i'm also going through your website right now and i was just wondering are you is are you where do you see madam architect going like i mean I, I this was just like off the bat like i was just thinking that are you thinking of like global collaborations you know because like i'm from pakistan and i was just wondering like there's so many amazing women who are practicing there and i'm sure it's the case like you know like mariam kamara is an example and there's so many women out there who don't even have a voice and they're just working working and kind of you know between all these men, like, I mean, I, I don't even think a lot of people would know these. I mean, I'm just curious, like, do you, do you see it going everywhere? <laughs> like, I would imagine you would make those connections even through school, right? Yeah, what like, do you mean by collaborations? Do you mean just like profiling more people or? Yeah, 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 exactly. Like maybe expanding the profiles like you were showing us uh, your broad categories. Like, you know, I, I was just thinking more about like, I mean, I know you're, it's, it's, it's still very new, but uh, I could see this like, you know, do, do you think it would get further or are you trying to? <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. I don't think we would do, I don't think we would use the Madam Architect brand and like do Madam Architect Russia or like, you know, I don't think yeah, it would yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. go that way just, um, just because of like the, um, capacity I have right now but of course like we're we we do an interview a week sometimes we do more um the other part of it is you know there's we're a team of four now it's me and three women that are also editors and they help me with transcripts and um some of them are doing their own interviews now which has been really great and they're also based you know one is in Atlanta one is in Houston and one is in New York and so we're trying to expand some of the geographic reach that way I think just like because we're all working full-time um it's hard to do more in like it's hard to do more interviews we're certainly looking to do a bigger variety of interviews um and in other in other countries as well um but no that's that's definitely a goal but in terms of it's it as a platform like you know we're talking about maybe maybe putting some of the interviews into a book um i don't know like a documentary series has also been talked about so there's definitely like we're planning farther reaches both in terms of like where people are based and what they're doing because you're right there's an endless supply of women and i've actually gotten questions before about like oh cool you published 100 interviews like are you done are you going to stop this and i was like no there's so many people and so many stories that have yet to be told um so yeah no that that is something we're thinking about just um yeah thank you i have a question about um I guess your parameters, like how do you decide um, which women to interview? And then I guess, how do you formulate like a set of questions around that? Uh, and is it like an, I'm oh, sorry, is there like an identity that you're looking for, for this, for this catalog of interviews? Like, Sure, sure. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I get this question a lot and like, it's interesting because, um, because it's not, kind of done in a vacuum like I don't do interviews like I don't just interview one woman um and then no one else oh, and what I mean by that is we have a monthly lineup right and so we interview someone every week and so who we choose to profile has a lot to do with who we've also who we've profiled in the past who we're profiling that same month and just to make sure that variety keeps going I would say um yeah, it, it just really depends just based on, you know, we look at where people are in their careers, what kind of perspective they have to offer if they're talking about what it's like to be a partner at a firm or if they're talking about what it's like to start a firm. Um, you know, and, and then the focus aspect I mentioned before, like what it is they actually do in the industry. So we make sure to get a variety of that. Um, I would say, yeah, it's not about one specific criteria that applies to everybody. I mean, I think we're just looking for as many different stories as possible and anyone that has contributed significantly. I mean, you know, we talked to um, Kelsey Keith, who's the editor in chief at, at Curge, like obviously the way she exerts her um, her contribution and her influence is is really widely spread because it's, it's um, a publication that you know is read in many places and focuses on many places so so people like that that just like have a lot of influence and are um kind of forming what the conversation is is important 
but yeah, I mean, I think every month we aim to interview somebody that has been in the profession for a while and maybe has their own firm. Every month we're looking to interview someone that's emerging and just, just getting started. Every month we look to interview someone that's in the industry, but not an architect. So a communications professional, a lawyer, just like someone that is influential in other ways. And then also once a month, I mean, I mean, not even once a month, we, we try to do this as much as possible, but we make sure to feature women of color. Um, and that's like a criteria that's pretty set just because it's in the same way that a platform like Madam Architect is needed where it's focused only on women. I think, you know, these spots and um, making sure to make very intentional room for women of color is important to us as well. So yeah, that's kind of the general criteria. But again, it just, it's all about how the group um, comes together and like whoever is going up next week has a lot to do with who we just profiled before them and who we're going to profile after them. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I was really curious about how you come upon all these women as well, like how you get exposed to them, but this, um, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how we find about them. I mean, when I first started, I just knew a ton already and like actually, you know, my college experience and being at Cornell, I mean, so many amazing women have, have come through, whether they're TAs or professors or PhD students. So that's where I got started. I think that's, you know, wherever you go to school, that's like your foundation and that's where a lot of things will stem from. And so like take every advantage of every opportunity you have. And then I get a lot of pitches. Every time I speak to a woman or every time I do an interview, I say, you know, who else should I speak to? And they'll give me a couple of names and then other people you just know of and want to talk to them. Um, so it's, it's a whole variety of things, but yeah, we get a lot of pitches. It's, it can be overwhelming and it's really hard to say no or not right now. Um, but such is, such is life. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have a question? Mm -hmm. uh, how do you prepare for the interview as in, and, um, do you, uh, has it changed over time? The kind of questions that you, um, uh, ask? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so at first when I started, I would, uh, so there was like a kind of a formula to the interviews, the, the Madam Architect feature interviews were a very particular type of interview where it was about the entirety of someone's career and kind of how they got to where they are, what where they are means to them, and what have been some challenges kind of looking back at everything and what advice they have. So it was very broad. Um, I also didn't tend to do too, too much research before I spoke to women. Obviously, I knew what they did and kind of maybe some of where they came from. But in some ways, I didn't want to know too much because I didn't want to project my own interests onto their careers or what might be important for them. Like I approached these interviews in a pretty open-ended way by saying like, you tell me what's been important to you through your career and what you wanted to do. Um, because I feel like if I was asking about a specific thing, like I'm interested in that specific thing and that's what I want to know, but is it important to them? Is it what they want to talk about? Like it was really important that it be their story. So that's kind of how it started. Now that I've done so many, um, we're finding that, you know, maybe some of the answers are very similar or obviously you don't want all the interviews to say the same thing and they never will because everyone is so different. But now it is, we do tie in some more topical things into the interviews, like the one with Janine Hayes um, that went up earlier this week from Afro Chic. That one was both about her career, but also about like what's going on right now and her advice with um, dealing with things right now. So those questions are starting to make their way into the interview. But also like to my point about um, having a column like days with where it's about the day. I mean, we're introducing some like different ways to interview and different pieces on Madam Architect beyond the feature interview to kind of tap into other themes and other discussions and other questions. And so that's some of what our what our new columns that we're launching will relate to. Uh, I was also wondering, like there are some questions that get asked so often to only women professionals and then there is some um like hesitation around um answering those and so how do you navigate that well, uh, which like, questions what do you mean uh, like you were saying uh there were some women who were starting a practice and they were pregnant at the same time mm -hmm. and the family and this and these are some topics that you that don't get asked uh to men mm -hmm in the same profession. So have you faced anything, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, like this when you're interviewing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I think those are important things to talk about. Um, I think parenting and actually like integrating whatever else is going on in your life, whether it be 
parenting, whether it be, you know, you're taking care of your parents that are living with you, whether it be like a medical thing, or maybe it's a hobby that someone does and they cycle a lot and do all these trips. Like, I think all of those things should be talked about. Um, unfortunately, especially the stuff about parenting does tend to fall on, on women because for so long they've been the primary caretakers and also because they're the ones that carry the child. Like, I think in some ways it would be really I think the questions I'm asking of women that are like that should be asked of men. I don't, I don't agree at all that they just shouldn't be asked of anybody because I think that does a huge disservice to like ignore a huge part of life that people deal with that like, like in some ways I, we talk, you guys should read um, Angie Lee's interview about this. She's a partner at FX Collaborative. She, you know, she talks about how you're expected to parent like you don't work and work like you don't parent, which is hugely unfair of everyone in any setting. Um, so I don't think things like this should be ignored. I don't think just because we don't ask them of men, we shouldn't ask them of women. I think we should ask them of everybody, you know, instead of asking, um, how do you manage childcare and, and owning a practice to women, we should totally be asking that of men. And actually what will happen, because I have asked some of those questions, is men will say, oh, you know, my wife helps me. Yeah, but I think like we need to sh shine some light on that, you know, and, and say, okay, well, that's, <laughs> is that like the way that it should go? Um, yeah, so I don't think we should stop asking them overall. That's just ignoring a huge part of life that affects a lot of things. I think we should just be asking them of everyone. I agree with that. I think that's good. <laughs> Are you, have you interviewed anyone um, out? So you talked, you kind of broke down the different categories um, mm -hmm. in a way and, you know, sort of telling us each week what your plan is or each month. And mm -hmm. I was thinking a little bit about some of these people that wouldn't fall under the term architect or even be in an allied discipline, mm -hmm. but more of like um, a mayor or someone in policy and how, um, how, how could you, for instance, bring this and that you know, that relation, the people who are really visionary and thinking about mm -hmm. the world through space and uh, mm -hmm. things like this um, could be quite interesting to. Yeah, we interviewed, actually, we interviewed Alicia Glenn um, at the end of last year, who's the former deputy mayor of, of New York. Um, we, we don't know what she's going to do next. There's a lot of speculation that she's going to start a real estate firm. But, you know, we spoke to her. We spoke to Marianne Gilmartin, who's a developer, um, former CEO of Four City Ratner. Who's now, who now just launched her own development company, Mag Partners. And we talked to Marianne Tai, who's a really like, I think she's been voted or she's been on a bunch of like most powerful New Yorkers lists. Um, she's a broker, she's, she's a real estate broker um, and has kind of led some really significant deals like, you know, Vogue and Condé Nast um, leasing and building in Times Square, all that. So we have spoken to some of those women and that's important to us as well. We wanna do more of that. Um, it's it's turning into not just being women that advance the practice of architecture, but kind of women that are influential in the built environment. And I don't really know how to articulate that in a slogany way. Like women that advance the practice of architecture is like a, a good way to describe it. Um, I don't want to say that, you know the women that build our cities; those are trades women. But, you know, I can't claim that. <laughs> um, but but yeah, we we are looking to interview more people that are influential in the built environment beyond just like designing it or making or, or carrying it out but that are making policy decisions and and you know are within government and, and beyond mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting i mean it's like those who shape the world somehow right yeah. and through building yeah. through writing um i mean mm -hmm. you're one of those figures for sure mm -hmm. and, um as we were we were just looking at the work of mariam camara before you mm -hmm. joined and um, you know, looking at her website and the blogs that she writes, mm -hmm. um, you know, the way that she writes is very direct, and you know, kind of talking about the process of building something or construction, um, mm -hmm. making distinctions between global north and other places, but really thinking about um, and writing to the idea of um, how architecture comes about um, in a city, but always thinking about architecture and city together. Um, mm -hmm. and thinking about these social spaces. And, and just mm -hmm. one of the things we were talking about in a way is like, how is, how is the writing done so that it is both on one hand for the discipline, but also distinct and, and perhaps more for the public at large or, mm -hmm. that it, or that it could be, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so in a way, mm -hmm. I think you're, maybe you could talk a little bit about that through, the, um, through, through your, through your mm -hmm. blog. Yeah, absolutely. So actually, it's so interesting. I think everyone, 
everyone I've interviewed that's within a common theme, whether it be like people that have started their own firms or people that have started their own firms while having their first child, um, there's always like similar things that they'll say. And I've interviewed a few editors and journalists um, and, you know, critics and critics now. And that's, that's what their whole mission is. That's what all of them say their mission is, is to translate some of these ideas to a broader public. Um, I think, yeah, with Madam Architect, it's also, it was really important to me that the, um, the interview topics not be too insular. Like I think in architecture, you know, there's words that we use that, um, you know, our consultants don't use and that the trades people don't use and that are kind of, um, yeah, it's a little bit of a cocooned world a little bit sometimes. And so with Madam Architect, I, tr I also try not to get too much into design. In some interviews, it's inevitable just because that's what the focus is. And like I said, I try to let the interview drive itself and the woman to define what the story is like and not me. Um, but I've wanted these interviews to be very accessible to other women in other fields or anyone, men in other fields too. Um, and just everyone to be able to understand what architects are about and what they do and what they hope to do and also about how we navigate their careers. So. Um, it's, it's been interesting and I, I'm a member of um, an organ, like a, a group called The Wing, which is a co-working and social club for women. And unfortunately they've had to close down all of their spaces just given everything that's happening because the, you know, being a physical business is really their, their bread and butter. Um, but I had met, and the reason I joined is because I realized all of my friends were in architecture or real estate or design in some way. And I just, I knew nobody in government. I knew nobody that was a journalist. You know, I knew nobody in fashion and, join this group to meet these women and so many friends I've made there they read Madam Architect and Madam Architect has become kind of a source for them and so I think at large with the writing that comes from Madam Architect I think I do aim for it to be not just for architects and I think it's also I have two missions obviously one of them is to elevate women and elevate and you know bring um bring attention to the work that women are doing in ways that haven't been done before, but also it's to elevate architects period in a way that's um, really digestible. And I'm hoping that as Madam Architect kind of gains more and more traction and, um, you know, it's highlighted more in other ways that people will know of it and read it that are not in the practice and thus like know more about architects than what our goals are and things like this. Do you, I have a couple of questions. I don't know if yeah. Student, if you guys have questions, please jump in. Um, I was curious, we had a, a speaker a couple of weeks ago um, mm -hmm. who's a writer and she, she came and she actually showed us all her journals that she oh, writes wow. in and she read from them and, you know, was encouraging everyone to write every single day. And yeah. I, I'm curious. <laughs> Yeah, I'm curious if you if you also do that. I mean, it's hard. I don't know how you do it. You know, you're mm -hmm. you're practicing. You're also mm -hmm. um, maintaining this, and you're collaborating mm -hmm. with others. And um, mm -hmm. but I was curious. Do you keep a separate something separate? Like, do you have things you write about the interviews that are separate from the content that came out of it? It'd be mm -hmm. interesting to think about these observations and um, mm -hmm. you know. Kind yeah, of I would say when I just with my schedule being what it is now the writing that i do is madam architect like it, it is what you see before i started though i was really yeah i was really really looking to integrate writing into it and i would just do that by journaling every day and a lot of it it actually got a little stressful at some point because i would write about all the things that i wanted to do or like ideas i had and i, I one thing I, i'll also say is um I would never plan for Madam Architect to be what it is today. And I never, I never woke up and just said to myself, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to start this website and I'm going to interview all these, women. like never, 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 never. It was so organic and cumulative. And like I was describing, you know, at the beginning, one thing led to another, but, um, but bef as I was going through all that, I had a ton of other ideas and there was a project I was running for a while on Instagram where I was doodling every day. I, I don't know. I, I think I had a goal just like being in front of a screen, uh, working in practice. Um, I had the goal of, yes, writing something every day. And I would do that by journaling, just like about my day or about things I wanted to do or ideas I had. And also by doodling and doing these small, um, easy drawings. And I used to have a project going on Instagram where I would post one doodle a day. And that was my goal is just like before bedtime, I would doodle a bit to music. And then the next day I would post it on Instagram. Um, it's still on there. 
It's, I don't, if you guys are curious, it's called Lina Creative, L-I-N-A. And I thought maybe I would start like a creative agency from this, which did not happen. <laughs> but it was, um, I guess, for me, writing, writing was just an example of like a personal project that I, that was important to me to keep going. So in the same way that this woman said, you know, you should aim to write every day. I totally agree. I would take that even beyond and just say you should do one thing a day that like is for you or it's what you want, whether that be, um, I don't know, taking a walk and photographing everything you see on your walks and the streetscapes of New York, whether it's doodling, whether it's writing, whether it's like having conversations and maybe you FaceTime with someone for five minutes every day, just anything like yeah. that that advances your interests and, and kind of your mission, I would encourage. Yeah, for sure. The idea of just being creative all the time, but something that's not for a deadline or a project yeah. or for someone else, but to kind of keep that, you know, it's a must design if we talk specifically about design or perhaps writing as well, mm -hmm. right? To just the practice of doing that over and over. It's a muscle, exactly. right? And if you exactly. let that atrophy, it's much harder to to come mm -hmm. back to that for sure. Exactly. That's, exactly. that's really interesting. That's yeah. yeah. I would actually uh, want to, to ask a little bit since you also mentioned it now, like about uh, media itself. So why you chose to write it. Uh, I, I know that I'm Meta Marketer has the Instagram and uh, just your thoughts about like these different types of media, especially now where we're all in mm -hmm. contact with that because of our current situation. But how do you think these different kind of media affect what uh, you have written in, in different projects and you've talked about maybe doing a book later on. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this has a lot to do with our class because it is about architects going into this media. So mm -hmm. just your general mm -hmm. thoughts about this kind of differences. Yeah, that's a great question. It's kind of similar to the point that I was making before about if you're a practicing architect, you should be taking advantage of every single um, path of output, like a building is output, a uh, lecture is output, you know, writing is output and, and all these different uh, ways reach different audiences and get people to understand your work at a different level. It's kind of been the same way for Bantam Architect in its evolution. Um, like social media has been huge for us and it's completely how we were able to gain a following that we did just by sharing every interview every week through all the different platforms and like Instagram is one way and that reaches a certain audience, you know, it's very millennial heavy um, and now Gen Z. And so we reach, you know, people like that in that way, LinkedIn, reaches some of the older um, practicing mm -hmm. professionals, Facebook, you know, reaches people's grandmothers, <laughs> and, <laughs> like aunts and uncles. And, and so we don't, um, we don't discount any way to spread the word. And we're, I don't know, I hate, I hate people that are like, sorry, I don't hate people. I hate it when people are too exclusive for something like, oh, I don't do that because it's not cool. Or I don't know, I think you should just take advantage of like, everything you have at your fingertips in every way and um, something will come out of that. So anyway, for us, like sharing on media and making use of different media just reaches different audiences in different ways. And so with a book, like what's, what would be nice about that is, you know, it's a very permanent, like, like Madam Architect, the website is sort of an archive. Like uh, people have asked me to do a podcast uh, a bunch of times and it's very labor intensive or I, I think it would be. So it's not something I can do right now, but also with a podcast, like, it feels a lot more ephemeral than like a written record mm -hmm. of the interview that's going to be online for, for, you know, a long, long, long time. And a book goes even beyond that. Like a book will be in someone's home for hopefully the rest of their lives, you know, or for years and years um, and will be this constant reminder. So it's just like different media platforms reach different people and connect with people in different ways. Um, and yeah, I, I don't exclude anything. I mean, obviously I excluded a podcast just because it's not possible right now, but maybe that, that'll be right for us in the future. Um, so that's kind of how we approach it. Just everything has purpose and everything has value. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's time for one more question. I know, Julia, you have to hop off soon. Yeah, yeah, sure. I don't know if there's one more. We can yeah, add two more. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you about the... Um, like the editing process. Um, mm -hmm. so you ask, like you do the interview and then I guess there's a lot of like post uh, work. Yeah. Uh, just if you Sometimes could. more than others, yeah. Yeah. Um, but how do you, just how do you do that? How do you edit? How do you, what, mm -hmm. what's that process like? 
Sure. Yeah, it's changed over time just because I've done um, a lot more. And so at first, it was just extremely, extremely iterative in the same way that you would approach a design project, like you sketch or you draw through something once and follow through and then you come back to it and you get feedback on it and you do it again. It was just like that. I would um, transcribe the whole interview, which I don't do anymore because oftentimes like I know when, now when I conduct the interviews, I'll take notes on moments where whoever I'm talking to gets particularly excited or particularly passionate. And I know that what, what they're talking about is the thing that is more meaningful to them than maybe some other things that they've talked about. So I keep that in mind, but yeah, I would like transcribe the whole thing, read through it once, um, see what stands out, read through it again, start taking things out, read through it again. And it would be like a series of, I don't know, six or seven or 10 read throughs. Um, but that was at the very beginning before I was experienced in something like this. Now it's a lot, a lot faster. And now I don't even transcribe everything just because some things are things that everyone says and have been said in a lot of interviews. So they're less, um, they're kind of less salient and less about that particular person. And so we don't, you know, we just move on. Um, sometimes what will happen and conversations tend to be longer or shorter. Like, you know, if I end up talking to someone for two hours, I'm not going to transcribe that whole thing because that would be four hours of transcribing and then who knows how many hours of editing. Um, and some interviews are only a half hour, in which case usually I'll transcribe everything and that'll be the interview. So it kind of depends. Um, but yeah, just it just comes with experience and following through and um, the accumulation of another edit and another edit and another edit. And yeah, I would just say it's very, very similar to how you'd work through like a studio project and just like taking a stab at it and then again, again, again. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank Can you, Julia. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. One more. Go ahead. No, 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 no. Okay. Just something really quick. Uh, yeah. You said there are four people working with you now, right? For uh -huh. the the website are they all architects or yeah actually they are which has been really cool well so they're all trained as architects um one is a licensed architect and a mom of two and she was my very very first editor that had reached out um also everyone's volunteering I, i'm volunteering they're volunteering and so i haven't really gone out to people to recruit for help even when i really needed it because i didn't feel like i could um kind of put this on someone and say, hey, can you do this for me? And also you're not gonna get paid. Like <laughs> that's not, um, so everyone that is that is working with me have um, reached out themselves and have wanted to do this knowing that that would be the case, which has been, I've been lucky in that way. Um, but yeah, what, one is a licensed architect. One is recently graduated. And so she's working as a designer right now. And one studied architecture and then studied landscape architecture, worked as a designer and then did something very similar to me and switched over into marketing. Um, and she really loves writing. So it's actually interesting. They all have different strengths, I would say. One is um, very, very organized and really good at just like operations kind of things. One is really good at um, promoting and talking about the work, like talking about the interviews after the fact. And one is really, really good at editing and proofreading. Mm -hmm. And so that's been interesting to see. But now they're all doing their own interviews too, which is kind of nice because I love that it's starting to be a network of women that speak to other women and, and write about other women. Yeah. Amazing. That's great. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for coming today and for thank Madam Architect. Me. It's wonderful that we have that as a source. And thank you so much. And thank you guys for all your questions. They were so, they were really amazing and not questions, some, some that I hear more often, but um, some of these were really unique. So I appreciate that. It gives me a lot to think about too. That's great. Great. Thank oh, you so awesome. much. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank All right, you. everyone, we can, um, we can stay on just for a couple more minutes. Um, so I, I don't know if you have any questions or comments from today. It's always useful for me to hear back um, from you what you thought of the class. And um, so I'm happy to hear things today. Or if you want to send me a note by email, that also works really well. Um, and I've been collecting those over the semester. So it's super, super useful uh, for me. So please share any thoughts you have um, as I'm thinking about how this class evolves and how what it could be like in the future uh, is helpful. So, so I think technically, I guess this is our, our last meeting. It seems hard to believe that, but I do have the, there are three more Zoom calls set up on the, um, the link. Uh, and I would like to still meet. I'm, I'm happy to meet again. And um, I think I did have a couple makeups anyways, but um, just in our 
you know, sort of readjusting, we're a little bit out of sync. And so what I was thinking, and I mentioned last time, but for the next meeting, uh, we can look at the work of Anne uh, Lacatan and then Momo Yo uh, Kojima from uh, Atelier Bow Wow. So I'd like to look at the, those two together for next week. I know we're moving into final production mode and um, for studios and then final reviews will be starting. So. Um, I understand if you can't make it, but if you can come even for a little bit, that's I'm happy if people sort of pop in and out, that's okay. Uh, and then we can meet again the following two Fridays. And um, perhaps the last session uh, could be for you guys to just share what you've worked on uh, and so on. I will send you an email with a kind of final um, deadline when everything is due. I'll, I'm happy to push that to like the last moment possible. If, should you finish early, you know, feel free to send it in. Um, you don't have to wait, but um, otherwise let's just hopefully keep meeting over the next couple of weeks. If you would like to talk independently also, um, I'm happy to do that. Or we could certainly turn these Friday sessions into that where you have more of a one-on-one, -on -one. but just um, send me an email and um, we can find time to meet. That sounds good to everybody. Okay. All right. I don't know, anyone have any comments or Thoughts from today? All right. No, just it was really cool to listen to her. <laughs> Good. <laughs> just as a feedback, I think uh, maybe to the other uh, seminars you give, you should invite her again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. That sounds great. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah, inspiring. Great. I just, I just think. I feel like I'm now going through like her website and thinking there's so many things that women also have to think about. I mean, even men have to think about, but really you're, you're not just an architect. You're also so many other things. And I, like, I was just like, wow, that's, it's kind of great to get that. Um, and also just something she mentioned about like taking advantage of, or not advantage, but like, you know, you using the people you have, like you or resources that are to us. Um, mm -hmm. I, I never like actively think about it. I think it's something we just have. Mm -hmm. But it's true, there aren't enough female mm -hmm. mentors, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was well, nice. I'm glad yeah. she said that. Yeah, that's good. Well, they're definitely out there. I mean, I think also as a student, you have each other. And I know it's hard now that we're physically separated, but um, you, you, sh you need to work a little harder to keep up your contacts, you know, with your classmates. And they really will be a great resource for you in, in the future. But I like this idea of um, going back to your first comment about, um, you know, not just an architect, but all these other things. And, you know, when I was a student in undergrad, it was really, you were an architect and that was it. Um, but as I learned more and the world was evolving, going to graduate school, it was, you know, multi-hyphenated, <laughs> um, uh, person, right? So you can be an architect, a writer, educator, planner, urban designer, scientist, right? Like there's this kind of um, endless stream of things almost. So it's, and I think for sure GSAP is a school that advocates for that and establishes a kind of platform um, in ways that other places don't. And, you know, for sure being in the city um, uh, allows for that, right? Um, so great. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, everyone be well, stay safe and, and let me know. Please write to me. I'm happy to, to meet um, outside of the class. So, okay. Bye.